Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Magdalena Hajdukiewicz, and I'm the current chairperson of Engineers Ireland West Region Committee. I want to welcome you all tonight at the launch of the Engineering National Development Continuing Professional Development Series uh, organized by the West Region. This series marks the recent publication of Ireland's National Development Plan and aims to showcase and promote new ideas to engineering practice across all sectors aligned with Project Ireland 2040 strategy. The Engineering National Development Series will deliver a mix of online and hopefully in-person events under the teams of the National strategic, strategic Outcomes. And today marks the first event of the series. Uh, the event is aligned with the strategic outcome on, on the access to quality childcare, education and health services. And we have three excellent speakers. Dr. Orla Flynn, who is the current president of Goway Mayo Institute of Technology. She has 20 years experience in education management uh, roles at Cork Institute of Technology. And prior to that, she was a lecturer in the Department of Mathematics and Computing at CIT. Dr. Flynn uh, holds undergraduate and postgraduate qualifications in mathematical physics and computer science, master in management and education, and the PhD from the University of Limerick. Our second speaker is Dr. Adele Doherty, who is a postdoctoral researcher and project manager in engineering at NUI Goway. She is a chartered engineer with a PhD in engineered systems performance assessment and benchmarking. And Dr. Doherty has previous experience of working as a process engineer at Atkins and an energy engineer with the health service executive. And our final speaker tonight is Dr. Marcel Lumens, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of the Built Environment at Eindhoven University of Technology. His areas of expertise include building technology, uh, environmental studies, indoor environment, building physics, computational fluid dynamics, sustainable energy and performance-based buildings. Dr. Lumens obtained his PhD on the topic of indoor airflow and continued his work at the Dutch Applied Research Institute, TNO and Eindhoven University of Technology. So before we start, uh, just a few housekeeping items. After the three presentations, we will have a Q&A session. So the microphones of all participants are muted. However, we encourage you to post questions in the Q&A box and we will address them at the end. So just make sure that you, that you put any questions in the Q&A box. Um, so thank you uh, very much. And I'll ask our first speaker, Dr. Orla Flynn, to present. And thank you, Magda, and uh, absolutely delighted to be here uh, this evening, and uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen there now for the moment. Okay, so... Okay, so um, today I really I just move on there to, to maybe some of the topics that I wanted to share with you um, uh, this evening. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our journey from uh, becoming, uh, well, fr from starting out as a regional technical college. Now we've been GMIT for many years and uh, our recent journey to becoming the Atlantic Technological University. So I'll speak a little bit about that. I do want to speak then a bit, a bit about engineering and GMIT, uh, about the scale of activities that we have, the growth projected and some ideas around the future of engineering. And uh, I suppose some of the engineering that will be necessary uh, to, to see us achieve uh, some of our own ambitions. So infrastructural challenges uh, in, in GMIT, uh, and then a couple of projects that we're involved in, uh, which I know that um, many, of you, many of you may well be interested in. Um, and I wanted to mention the Athena Swan recognition, which is uh, really around uh, equality. It's an equality initiative really around uh, female academics in, in, in leadership positions. So uh, just moving on, um, working towards a, a technological university. Uh, so we are merging, and this, ho I hope you have heard about it already, but we're merging with IT Sligo uh, and Letterkenny IT to become a, a new technological university. And uh, again, you can see the timeline there. Uh, we are, um, the, the minister made his announcement there in October. And 
the title of the new university is, will be Atlantic Technological University, and the date actually will be the 1st of April, and, and that's the date uh, that we are, uh, we will no longer be GMIT, and that's really going to be a very interesting journey uh, for us. Um, just to mention there that the Atlantic Technological University will be one of the largest multi-campus universities on the island of Ireland. Uh, and I'm not going to dwell on these points. You can replay them afterwards uh, or you can have the presentation um, later on. Uh, we will be a leader in the provision of access to higher education. And what that means is not just access to people who, who have not been able to get into higher education, but it also means that we will be um, providing access to people who are already in employment, uh, people who want to work from home or people who are unemployed or, as I said, in employment. Uh, so from pre-degree uh, right up to doctoral level, uh, including uh, apprenticeship provision, and, and I'm going to mention that uh, in a while. A big role for us as a new TU will be supporting the needs of enterprises, and again, especially uh, SMEs, and the whole um, aspect of collaborative research and innovation and uh, knowledge transfer, uh, really working with industry in the region to support economic and, and social prosperity. And we will have the critical mass and academic depth to attract, educate, nurture and retain talent in the West. And I think that's one of the big missions of a technological university is to be an anchor tenant uh, in the region. And I think you saw from the map um, that we are a very geographically dispersed region. And uh, I think um, we, we're also a region in transition. So this is the West and Northwestern region. So I appreciate the event this evening is, is looking more at the West, but as, as uh, the new university will span a much um, larger um, region and it will differ a good bit as well. You have Galway city uh, and, the, and the area right around Galway, but then you have some, some quite rural areas as well. We will have good scale and critical mass, and that means that we'll have greater capacity for collaboration uh, with external partners. So again, that's part of the Technological University um, remit, is to, to be a connecting point for the region uh, into uh, international partnerships. So th that's really the kind of the, the background. And we do have an external newsletter. I think we're on to edition number three now, and there's a link to that is, is provided there, but you also should be able to find links uh, to the newsletters uh, from our uh, website. At the moment, it's CU Alliance, because we were the Connacht Ulster Alliance, and uh, we will be still the Connacht Ulster Alliance until we the new university forms. Um, and then I just wanted to talk a little bit about when, when we talked about critical mass, we will have over 22,000 students and uh, over 2,000 staff across those um, eight or probably nine sites now when St. Angela, St. Angela's College joins us. Uh, but if we were to, to form a Faculty of Engineering and Technology, and we're kind of at early stages at the moment in terms of talking about structures, uh, but uh, there, there is likely to be some sort of an engineering faculty. Uh, you can see there the breakdown in the different disciplines that we will have. So that's about 6,000 students, whole time equivalent students. Um, it doesn't include students in the Yates Academy of Art, Design and Architecture in Sligo. It does include computing in GMIT, and that is uh, to allow us to, um, to kind of compare like with like. And uh, there's a, a mention there of automation and robotics, and I'll be talking a little bit later on about the Transcend project uh, in GMIT. So overall, uh, you know, we, we will be a formidable um, entity right across the region, as I said, in terms of scale uh, in and in terms of the breadth of engineering uh, that is, is going on. So maybe taking a step back from the ATU and maybe just to have a look at engineering growth in, in GMIT. And uh, it, it, GMIT has been through a period of very significant growth. Um, our, our, our overall STEM numbers have grown uh, significantly in the last five, six years. You can see there that we've had a 64% increase in whole time equivalents in GMIT at undergraduate, postgraduate and apprenticeship levels uh, since 2015-16. And I'm going to come back to the future projected growth uh, again in, uh, in, in a couple of slides. Uh, but maybe just to look at a, a bit about the future of engineering, and, and you all know this um, by now, but uh, you know, we're seeing a kind of a blending of disciplines and we're seeing that kind of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach to, to different projects. And we're seeing technology um, underpin many, many initiatives. 
you know, I think we, 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 we all know now that even on a building site now, it's underpinned by tech. And the whole thing about Industry 4.0, where we are seeing powerful technologies um, being harnessed like artificial intelligence, robotics, advanced manufacturing, and the Internet of Things. And uh, we in GMIT have set up, uh, and I, I want to pay tribute to um, Dr. Corinne Gachon, who's heading this up, but uh, Professor Graham Heaslip, who's head of School of Our Engineering for the last 12 months, uh, really in setting up this uh, project. It's called the Transcend Project. And its, its role really is to assist industry in the West uh, in its digital uh, transformation and whatever, no matter what kind of transformation. So we, we hope to have, uh, well, we're, we're implementing a makerspace to engage further with industry, a virtual reality digital twin, and we've invested fairly heavily ourselves in GMIT, but also in partnership with Thermo King, uh, in automation and uh, robotics. And maybe just to sh highlight uh, some of the programs that are aligned there with Transcend. So uh, we have Nemesi in Design and Innovation, which I've highlighted because I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But you can see there the, the big focus on automation and robotics, but also um, a focus there on apprenticeships. And these are not um, necessarily the traditional craft apprenticeships, although those are important uh, still to us in GMIT and we have electrical and, and motor apprentices um, and, and a new one in, in wood uh, manufacturing as well. Um, these are more of the, the higher education apprenticeships. And uh, again, it's a consortium uh, type approach uh, led by GMIT, but involving other partners around the country. And uh, we have a, a number of other programs that are awaiting validation and they're in a queue. And again, you can see advanced manufacturing systems, again, a good bit more in um, automation, robotics, digital manufacturing, um, master's degree in automation and digital manufacturing uh, and so on. So HDIP, which would be more of a kind of a conversion course and a really interesting certificate. I think it's springboard funded uh, in drones and smart agri sensors. So we have, you know, we have that agri engineering uh, aspect to it again. Kind of wanted to mention a little bit about the MSc in design and innovation because really this is the way forward. You know, the 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 Ireland has a lot of problems, and um, engineers are going to be play a critical role in solving those problems. Um, but ideally, they'll solve them in partnership with with other other people from other disciplines and from end users. And that's the whole real thinking, um, the background really behind our new MSc in design and innovation. So it started about a year ago. Uh, it's, it runs over two years, it's part-time over two years, and a real focus on, on, Stan, on Stanford, Stanford's D-School design thinking approach. Um, and one of the most enjoyable mornings I, I had recently, I spent with uh, students on this program who uh, uh, were presenting, they, they, they worked with a, a company called Cineco and with Galway Parkinson's Association, and there were a number of projects out there that the company challenged the class to design a medicine compliance system for patients suffering there from Parkinson's disease. And there was a whole range of, of solutions and approaches to problem solving. Uh, so whether you were an engineer or working in science or customer service, healthcare, or indeed if you work in public sector, like the one of our, our county councils or city council, uh, really, this this would be a very very interesting course uh, to do. So, looking forward to kind of seeing the the, fi the final product there. Um, a little bit of projected growth for us in GMIT. So, uh, the the arrow shows kind of where we are at the moment, uh, 21, 22, and you can see there that we're we're projecting a nice bit of growth in the, in the coming years and. Future growth is mostly going to be seen. Obviously, we've spoken about the automation, robotics um, growth and programs there. So, so that's one thing we've looked at. But we're going to see a good bit um, more activity in the postgraduate space. Uh, and that's, again, part of our remit towards becoming a technological university. We are going to be seeing a big increase in, in research. Um, and uh, you know, we, we've already joined uh, Lero earlier this year, again, through the activities of, uh, of one of our engineering colleagues. Uh, but we're also going to see growth in apprenticeships, and uh, I think those are, uh, you know, two areas really for us uh, to watch. One of the things you might ask, well, you know, if you're if you're experiencing all that growth, um, surely you're going to be experiencing some engineering problems of your own. So I want to maybe reflect a little bit on our infrastructural challenges. So we've had about 45% growth in student numbers in STEM uh, in the last six years, and that's again in full-time equivalents. 
about 7% per annum, and, and that growth looks set to continue, which is good news. We have technological university ambitions, so growth in research and postgraduate activities. You know, we have a lack of student sporting facilities, and the way we've tackled that has been almost like a plus for us. We've taken a partnership approach with Galwegians, Lee Mellows GA and Murview AFC, and that has allowed us to really to work very much in partnership uh, with various community organizations and allows us to invest in, in shared facilities. So th there's a plus there, I guess, as well as a, a minus. Um, transport, student accommodation, they're massive issues. Uh, you know, I had an email there from someone just this evening, uh, major drama, Erasmus students coming for the second semester and can't get accommodation. So uh, student accommodation is a big issue. It's big for us in Galway, but it's, um, it's also big in, our, in Mayo and Mount Bellew. Uh, and right around the country. Um, and we have a restricted enough land bank at our main uh, Galway campus. And we, we have a number of infrastructural projects. We have a master planning exercise, which we hope to unveil fairly soon. Uh, and I'm just gonna maybe share a little bit about the first three of those. So STEM building, student building, uh, the crew project. Um, again, we will be leasing some offsite premises for office space. We are um, concluding a purchase of Crowley Park, uh, Galwegian's Rugby Club, but that will be more of a long-term usage. And we own um, Murrow House and some, some grounds uh, around it, but um, you know that's more of a longer-term um, agenda. So our STEM building um, is being built uh, by a public-private partnership. And I suppose the public-private partnership a series of um, buildings, they're being developed in a, in a series of bundles, well, two bundles, but we're in the, a bundle with a number of other projects. And this all would have started around 2016, 17. So the building was supposed to enable us to deliver growth. And we've already delivered the kind of growth um, that that building was supposed to allow us to, to deliver. So you can see here that we're, we're, we're very much um, uh, bursting at the seams and really can't wait to see this started. So it's um, gone out to tender now uh, at the moment. And uh, the construction um, will be, and commissioning and all of that will be hopefully starting by the end of next year. So we're hoping to, again, to see everything going well. We're hoping to see um, cranes on site by the end of next uh, calendar year. Uh, it'll take a bit of time to construct it and equip it, finish it off and equip it. So, you know, we are hoping uh, to, to see students in there by the end of 2024. So that'll be a, a huge uh, addition. Uh, it, it will be built there kind of facing the Ballyban Road. So if you were kind of coming in from the, the Dublin Road, from Galway Crystal there and heading up to Ballyban Road, you, you, you'd see it there on your left-hand side. The other big building that we're looking to build again is that if you were to continue on in uh, into the city centre of Galway, on the left-hand side, you can see we have a playing pitch there, but we have planning permission for a student building there. And again, it would have uh, sports facilities, a large hall, and you know other play other facilities for students. Uh, so where we are at the moment uh, on that is uh, stage one uh, uh, published, and stage two will be uh, published uh, for, for that in, in 2022. And we're, so we're still really very much at air, at design kind of uh, pre tender phase. And uh, we hope to go to tender and approval uh, fairly quickly. Now, this, is, this can be constructed much more quickly uh, because of the, A, the type of building that it, that it is, but, but B, because it is not part of a PPP uh, and, um, in a bundle. So we will be um, building this ourselves. So again, hoping to see um, occupancy, occupancy for this one um, in early 2024. Um, the Creative Enterprises um, West project was funded by Enterprise Ireland through the Regional Economic Development Fund uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, I think late 2019, actually. And uh, this really is for um, the creative enterprises. Uh, it's, it's like an incubator hub for the creative sector. And uh, the crew company, uh, Coebrew, um, is uh, planning to build a very, very interesting building on the grounds of our Clunvera uh, campus, which is where we have our art college. Um, and again, quite an interesting, um, quite an interesting building proposed there. And you may have seen in recent kind of news that uh, planning permission was received for this development, uh, literally only in the last week or so. 
So I'm just conscious of time. Um, moving on then to talk a little bit about two projects that GMIT is involved in. One of those is the Build Digital Project. And again, it was announced by uh, Michael McGrath, Minister for uh, Deeper Public Expenditure and, and Reform. Um, and uh, he awarded the funding to the Build Digital Alliance led by TU Dublin, uh, but with a number of participants around the country and GMIT is one of those uh, participants. And the purpose of the, the Build Digital uh, really was again, and since today is talking about the Project Ireland 2040, but uh, this, this project was established under that to foster increasing levels of innovation in the Irish uh, construction sector. So uh, again, it drew on a wide ranging survey, um, a lot of consultation and uh, hopefully uh, will deliver um, increased digital adoption uh, there. So I've put in a link to that, um, uh, just some announcements uh, on that. Um, project and um, the TU Dublin uh, website. Uh, I, I suspect the, the, the website for the project, it was only announced there a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and again, it's around the National Centre of Excellence and um, five pillars. Uh, and you can see the pillars there. Again, it's around build, building digital, of course. And GMIT is represented across all five pillars, but we're the lead on three of the pillars, the digital leadership and culture change, digital standards, and then the last um, one there, sustainability, climate action, and the circular economy. So we have a lot of experience in that digital space um, with particular strengths in buildings, uh, information management um, uh, systems there. Moving on then to another project uh, that we're involved in that you may be interested in, uh, and it's called the DASB project. And again, the Digital Academy for Sustainable Built Environment. And this is funded under the Human Capital Initiative Pillar 3 call. Uh, it's being led, uh, so, so again, it's a collaboration um, of higher education institutes and industry partners. And again, it's really about being agile, and responsive to the upskilling needs of the construction industry and really trying to ensure that the sustainability skills, green construction, digital skills relating to um, those kind of, um, those type of builds and, and refurbs uh, that, that, we're, that we're agile in how we uh, support, support you. There is a video there, I'm not gonna play it. I, I've embedded it there in the, in the PowerPoint. Um, and it just tells a little bit more about the project. Uh, the partners, Technology University of the Shannon Midlands and Midwest, they used to be um, the artists formerly known as LIT, uh, ourselves, and we will be ATU uh, shortly. Uh, but the Tipperary Energy Agency and the Irish Green Building Council are also partners in that uh, project. And again, it's offering construction professionals um, uh, a range of programs in energy efficiency, um, circular economy and digitalization. And we will have three new um, MSc offerings that will that have come from this, this, this initiative, an MSc in building regulation, and that includes a search and fire regulation, uh, an MSc in circular economy leadership for, for a sustainable built environment, and then MS, MSc in building information modeling and digital construction. So again, those are all programs that would be of interest to yourselves and, and really of relevance to what we're trying to do in Ireland in terms of uh, sustainable buildings um, going forward. Finally, just a little bit to mention about our Athena Swan. It's an initi initiative recognizing the underrepresentation of women in senior academic roles. And the, the whole Athena Swan process was where you had to have a self reflective analysis of both quantitative and quant qualitative data. So surveys, um, looking at your, your data in terms of gender breakdown uh, and doing a, a very focused analysis, uh, all of that, and developing a four-year gender plan. Uh, all three of our Atlantic Technological University partners hold the Athena Swan Bronze Award. And this is really uh, a big thing for us. It allows us to, to apply for, um, for, for research funding and, and all of that. But more importantly, and this is something that Engineers Ireland really has recognized down through the years, is the need for diverse um, teams of people and uh, the need to ensure that, I suppose, all kinds of people are involved in, 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 the, in our teams. And I think in, in GMIT, we're very fortunate in having a number of female heads of department in the engineering disciplines. And that's not something uh, that, that everyone can, can shout about. So we're very happy with that. But this particular initiative will be very relevant for our engineering disciplines. Uh, in some cases, we attract quite a lot of female students. Uh, in others, it's more of a struggle. Um, in apprenticeships and in mechanical engineering in particular, uh, we would struggle. So 
this is we're very keen to address this and uh, I suspect that we will see um, you will see us in GMIT looking to work with you and in industry partners in industry uh, to to work with us in in helping to recruit particularly more women into engineering because we, we have you know we need the talent in industry so uh, we need to get more girls into engineering so finally um, coming to the last slide I think here and uh, just a date for the diary, and uh, this is always, uh, I think it's been running now for 11 years, the 12th year will be held, the 12th International Construction Management Day Conference is coming up there on the 8th of March 2022, be hosted by the Department of Building and Civil Engineering. I know it's always really well attended. Last year we went virtual, and I think that that was actually really well received as well, and sometimes, um, uh, sometimes a virtual event can allow you to have really um, you know, worldwide speakers. So I know that they're working on the, the format uh, for that um, at the moment. Uh, so that's really it. Um, thanks very much. And uh, I look forward to maybe some questions later on in the end. Back to you, Magda. Thank you very much, Orla. Um, it's, you know, very interesting presentation. It's great to, to hear about GMIT's role on improving the, the access to higher education and to, to engineering courses. Um, I particularly liked your statement about engineering transitioning towards a new technological renaissance. You know, it's very true and the projects and what's happening uh, in terms of the, you know, at the national level in Ireland really reflects that. Um, and also, you know, it's important that, uh, as you mentioned, you know, the emphasis on the, on the interdisciplinary and diverse teams or collaborations to to solve the challenges that we that we face that our society face at the moment yeah and we have a very you know we're fortunate in gmit we have a terrific team of people who who are very much engaged in in kind of that kind of cutting edge and very very aware of what's going on in industry in those areas and i suppose good collaboration across those different disciplines so um, yeah so delighted with, with the team we have and the leadership that, that we have there Great, thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Dr. Adele Doherty. Adele, uh, if you want to share your presentation now, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Magda. Let's see you now. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar today. Um, it's uh, nice to see some names that I wouldn't probably have seen for a while. Um, as Magda said, my background is in engineering, um, but I recently found myself getting more and more involved in sustainability, particularly around behavioral change. And it's been interesting to see so many sectors and companies adopting more sustainable practices over the last few years. So tonight I want to chat to you about the ENERGE project, which stands for Energizing Education to Reduce Greenhouse Gas Emissions. It's an EU funded project that's funded by Interreg and it's led by Dr. Owen Clifford in NUI Galway and myself as the project manager. If you, any of you have any questions at any stage, as Magda said, you can pop them in the, the Q&A section um, and we can have a look at them later. And I might share some links to the project also for anyone that wants to see some, some more information. So the project is um, funded under the low carbon theme. It's been running since the start of 2019 and is due to finish in May 2023. We have various partners across Northwest Europe. Um, in total, we have around 11 partners and sub-partners that are involved. Our project budget is around 4.2 million. And we include countries. We have Ireland, Northern Ireland, France, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Germany involved in the project. And as part of this, given that Interreg is generally quite an applied type research funding area, we have some demonstration schools across those countries that we use as part of this project. And we'll show a little bit more about those later on. So in general, there is a need for low cost solutions that enable long-term resource efficiency in schools. So in general, our school buildings can be quite old. They can maybe have some extensions or renovations, but it can be very difficult to manage those buildings in terms of efficiency particularly when it comes to things like heating and electrical usage. So this project focuses on schools and we have selected schools because this is where we are educating our future decision makers. So why don't we involve them in sustainable processes now, give them an understanding of how energy works, where it comes from and what they can do to be more sustainable. 
Um, and as part of this, we hope that these students will take on new sustainable practices and then carry them not only home to their family, but also on in their life when they go into adulthood and when they start um, working in different sectors. So as I said, we have 13 different demonstration schools. We have approximately two in each of the countries. So we have two here in Ireland, in Galway. We have two in Northern Ireland, one in County Tyrone and one in County Down. Um, and these are really our labs for the project. This is where we apply the different methodologies and tools that we have. We interact with the students. They're very much involved in, in the entire project since the very start. Um, and it's proven to be a great way to show them how, how complicated it can be to save energy in some situations. So as part of each of these school student groups, we have something called an inerts committee. So this is a, like a group of about six or seven students and one or two staff that are really interested in saving energy in their school. This would be kind of similar to like an energy team or an energy management team you might see in other companies, particularly in larger pharmaceuticals of that where they would be quite energy intensive. Also in each of the schools that we have, we've installed some equipment to gather data for us. So we have indoor climate monitoring sensors, we have electrical meters installed in various parts of the schools. And then with all this data, we use this to populate what we call the inert platform and our intervention strategies, which is something that I will talk about a little bit later on. As we go through these slides, um, you may find that a lot of what we're talking about are targeted to 12 to 18 year olds, but everything is quite adaptable and it could be something that could be adapted to your workplace, whether you are in industry or in research, you might find there are some tools in here that might um, apply to your workplace also. So in general, our vision is that we have more sustainable schools across Northwest Europe. Uh, the challenge, as I said, is that it can be difficult to upgrade the buildings themselves. It's costly and time consuming, and it's just we can't really wait around for the buildings to be upgraded. We have to act in reducing our own energy usage on a day by day basis. So our plan is to motivate students to continue their energy efficient behaviours in life. We want to empower the staff and students to make choices and decisions in their own school to save energy. And we want to try and use affordable interventions, low cost or no cost interventions that can be used to save energy in the school without it requiring too much investment. Every school is an ecosystem of you know, students, staff, we have teachers, we have building supervisors, and all of these people play a key role in saving energy in their school. You might think the same of your workplace, you know, there's management, there are people that can make decisions, there are people that have to take action, and everyone has to work together to be more sustainable. Um, for these schools, we predominantly use the data that they have available, so it may be their billing data for electricity, along with the data that we generate in each of the schools, um, and it's our main kind of fuel for this project. We have a number of different tools that we use. Um, the ones I have highlighted there is mostly in terms of data collection. So the uh, energy meters and sensors that I've talked about and that I'll show you a little bit more about shortly. And then we also have uh, sociological partners in France, CNRS that are experts in really understanding the attitudes and behaviors of students and staff and how they interact with different sustainable practices in their school. Then in addition, we have different modules that we've developed. We have the Inert web platform that I will talk a little bit about later on. And that's a way to share this data with the students in a meaningful way. We have energy related educational modules. And the purpose of these is to introduce uh, sustainability and energy education into more of the subjects across the curriculum in Northwest Europe. And then we also have some more engineering type tools such as a school building stock audit methodology. Um, and various other small tools that we use for uh, looking at engineering options for energy reduction in the schools. So the first thing I just want to give you an idea of is the type of data that we're collecting. So what you will see here is some data that we have in terms of electrical usage in one of our schools. So it's taken over a week. Let's see now I should be able to point in this. So this was taken over the second week in January in 2020. And it gives you an idea of these larger columns are the school hours energy consumption. So this is the energy consumed between 
say eight and a half five, then we have some after school energy consumption that may be due to extracurricular classes or activities that are on in the school, and then nighttime consumption. And you can see this repeated over Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So the obvious thing is that you can see on Saturday and Sunday, it's a lot quieter in the school, so there's a lot less energy consumption. But we have found at times before we started collecting this data that you may find that the energy consumption could still be quite high, even at the weekends when there's not many around. And you can see it here for the Saturday that it's possibly a little bit higher than it needs to be when you consider that at least 95% of the school population are gone home and there may only be management or some teachers that are in on the Saturday to do some tasks for a few hours. So the idea of collecting data like this is that when we present it to the schools, we can show them that they're either being very efficient at weekends and turning everything off like they should be, or maybe we might be able to highlight areas where they can improve for the, the next week or the next month ahead. And this is the main point of the electricity data that we collect. So in general, we have electricity meters on the main income to get an idea of the overall energy consumption of the school. And then we've also picked some key areas around the school, such as maybe the canteen or some science blocks where there's maybe some kind of higher you know, like rooms that would use more energy usage than others. Um, and we focus on those areas that they would be kind of the significant energy users in that area. Um, the great benefit of this is that we can highlight um, items to say like principal or management staff that may not realize where their energy is used. Every month they see a bill and they probably sign for it and it gets paid out of their budget, but they don't have the time to actually sit down and try and decipher where the energy was used inside that month. So having this sort of data is very useful to them so that they can see um, what they might need to target. Something that we found as well with the data, um, and it's something that's had quite a big effect in our project, is COVID-19. So here you can see data from, um, sorry, I'll just get this laser pointer again. You can see data from the start of January 2020. And you'll notice as schools began to close down, or really the day that they closed, the daily energy usage dropped off completely. Um, and that's because nobody was in the school buildings. It was a very uh, quiet and eerie place to be, I'm sure. But something we can notice from the data is that even though a lot of the daily energy usage is gone, there is still quite a bit of nighttime energy usage that maybe isn't as necessary as um, you might think. So there may be some equipment that has to stay on, like you know, fridges or perhaps there's some uh, equipment for safety in terms of chemical gear and chemistry labs. But in general, there were probably things left on in this school that could have been turned off during that time. Um, so it's a really useful way of identifying other opportunities for switching off in the school as well. Now, as you can tell from looking at this data, it's quite complicated in that it takes a little bit of time to understand how all this works. So when we're collecting this data, the raw data that we get is impossible to understand unless you um, have an engineering background or really interested in it. But the idea of something like this platform, which is done on Power BI, is that we can use this to talk to principals and school management. But this isn't really the sort of graph that we would present to the students because it's maybe a little bit complicated for them to understand at a glance. So you will see later on that we simplify this a little bit further for them um, as part of their daily interactions with the project. In addition to electrical data, we also monitor quite a bit of indoor climate data. Um, I won't go into this too much because I know Professor or Dr. Lumens will go into this quite a bit in his presentation, but it's just to give a general idea of where this comes into play in the project. So when you think about sustainability, you say, well, what does the lighting levels in a classroom have to do with it or the CO2 levels in a classroom? But it all ties up. In the case of COVID at the moment, the windows are open a lot of the time to assist in ventilation. So you will notice that CO2 levels are probably a lot lower in classrooms and it's, again, it's part of the new ventilation strategy. But one of the parameters we measure is CO2 in the classrooms and we can see records in something like 15 minute intervals. And you can see the peaks for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And it gives you an idea of how busy or quiet the classroom may have been during that time because with these classrooms, some may not be occupied for a few hours, others may be occupied constantly throughout the day. And we can look at the CO2 levels and you can notice when they would go quite high, 
um, and you may need to add, kind of add ventilation to the classroom in terms of more passive ventilation, um, like opening the windows or perhaps opening the door. <clears throat> um, this is something that has become more popular in the Department of Education in the last year or two, as they're using CO2 levels as a, a tool in kind of helping with keeping schools open during COVID. So at the moment, a lot of schools have additional CO2 sensors that will, they don't really record data and store it the way that we would need it, but they do flash red in the case where CO2 levels are high and it's used as a warning for students and staff to maybe, you know, vacate the room and walk around the school for a few minutes to let the classroom ventilate or open the windows. And so when we monitor CO2, we're really looking at occupancy levels in classrooms. So we can tell if there's a classroom with very high energy usage and very low occupancy, that there's probably something left on in that classroom that could be turned off. In addition, we look at temperature levels. So again, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and this is a good way to look at how having the heating on and off may affect certain rooms in the school. So in some cases, some of our classrooms may sit at something like 18 and 20 degrees, but there may be other classrooms that are maybe you know, facing a different direction, different building fabric, different heaters available, and the temperature could sometimes be up at 22, 23, 24 degrees, which is really too warm for students when they're in a classroom environment. You want to generally keep that temperature lower so that they're more comfortable and alert during class time. And then we also look at lighting levels, and this gives us a good idea of whether the lights have been left on in a classroom. You can see here that these are sort of daytime peaks for when the classes are active, and then it drops off during the night and picks back up again during the day, which is the kind of trend you want to see. Um, you wouldn't want to see this bar continuing from Monday to Tuesday because it would mean that the lights had been left on in the classroom. So we use this data as part of our um, energy saving measures to get a feel for how busy certain parts of the school are at different stages. And it's also something that's very interesting for the students themselves and the teachers, um, because students or just people in general will have a different perception of how comfortable they are. Some people may be comfortable in 18 degrees room temperature, other people may find it cold. Um, so we use this data to educate the students on their own personal comfort and how it can vary from person to person and how it links back to the fabric of the room or the occupancy levels in the room as well. As part of our sociology um, data collection, we have done some surveys with the students. And some of the questions that we asked them at the start of this project was about turning off lights and non-essential equipment in their classrooms. So we asked them, would you turn off the lights when the classroom was already bright enough due to daylight? We've asked them, would you turn off the lights when you leave the classroom? Would you turn off other equipment like computers, you know, smart screens? And we asked them about whether they would try and keep the heat into a classroom by closing doors or pulling blinds when it's cold outside. And we find that it's a real mix of answers. You know, it's a mixture between, yeah, sometimes we do it. I've never turned off a light in my classroom. Um, and it's a real insight into how students perceive their classroom. Generally, they walk in, they don't really think about whether the light is on or off. And often the same can go for teachers sometimes because they're just so busy with the class. So we hope to do these surveys again uh, throughout the project. And we hope that given the interventions we've done in the schools, you will see a shift in the data that it will go from students saying that they never have turned off something in their classroom when it's not needed to saying that they would regularly turn it off and would save energy. Um, and that's down to some of the interventions that we apply in each of the schools that I'll show you shortly. So this gives you an idea of the amount of data that we're collecting in each of the schools. It's quite complicated. Um, as I said, we try to keep it simple for the students. So to do that, we use a number of different tools as part of the project. And I'll give you an insight on some of those now. So we have the Ineers web platform. The main idea of this is to pull all of the information in and simplify it down for the students so that when they walk past the screen and see the platform, it only takes five seconds for them to understand that maybe the school is using far more energy today than it was last week, or maybe it's using less, or that some of the classrooms are particularly warm or cold. And it just gives them a little bit of insight when they're passing between classes. Um, we also have a quite a large focus on educating the students on energy efficiency and where energy comes from and how it's created. So we have some educational modules on that as well that I will talk about in the next slide. 
And then the last thing I want to talk about for today is the implementation strategies that we have for each school. So these are small kind of interventions, tasks and activities that they can carry out in their school to save energy. And the idea is that they will continually carry these out over the school term. In addition to some of the things I'll talk about in the next few slides, we also have a set of key performance indicators that we use for the schools to measure energy consumption and general sustainability. And we have some uh, stock audit methodologies as well that I can talk about in the Q&A time if anyone has any questions. So the purpose of the educational modules, as I said, is to increase the energy literacy of the students in each of the schools. So it's broken down into three different modules. Um, these have all been developed by DCU. So the Castell section of DCU have developed these for us. And they've done that along with the teachers in the demonstration schools and included some of the students in that process as well. So as I said, we were constantly bringing the students into the entire project from, from start to finish. So these modules focus on being energy efficient. So the first module asks students to go home and make an energy diary and keep record of what they are doing. So it makes them stop for a second and be more aware of their actions and how they're influencing or affecting the energy usage both in school and at home. And then there is a second module where we talk about energy efficient buildings, how energy efficient buildings come to be, you know, how they're designed, how the design process works, how they're built, how they're tested and monitored after their um, kind of post occupancy. And it's very interesting for maybe students that are doing um, more kind of practical subjects to get involved in this, because you get a real understanding of, um, you know, LED lights and why are they used and what difference do they make? So they, it gives them a really good understanding. And then there's a third module that looks at sourcing and protecting energy. So this will talk about things like global warming, how energy is generated, and we'll look at wind and solar in particular to educate students so that they're a little bit more aware of how complicated it can be to generate the electricity that they use. The Anerids web platform is being developed by our partners in TU Delft. So the idea is that the platform will tie together many of the tools that we have in the NERS methodology, but its main purpose is to inform students of energy usage and climate data in their school and keep them engaged in the project by using challenges and call to actions to keep them uh, kind of tied into the whole sustainability movement and to make sure they don't um, act on it for a month and then forget about it for the rest of the year. So as part of this platform, the TU Delft have involved all of the demonstration schools and the inert committees to design this. So we realized quite quickly that if we sent a bunch of engineers and academics off to design this platform, we would probably do a good job in terms of how we think it looks, but it may not translate properly to 12 to 18 year olds, which is our main target for this. So the best option here was to involve the students themselves in the design process, and they've been designed and in, are involved in co-design sessions over the last year to look at the platform and to get an idea of what they think should be available on it, things that are maybe too complicated to be included on it, um, and to see how they interact with it over time. So as part of this, they've designed these five little um, cartoon guys, and they represent different indoor climate variables, such as lighting levels, or CO2 levels, or humidity. And they are used throughout the platform. Each of them have you know, different behaviors. The little guy, the water droplet guy, you see there's the humidity guy, and he gets angry looking if it's too humid in the classroom, and you know, he looks quite happy most of the time. And it's a quick way for students to get an understanding of how these parameters change in their classroom during the day, or maybe during different seasons between winter and summer. Um, so it's quite a cool platform and it's, it's nice to see that the students were involved in the design of this themselves. So to bring this platform to each of the schools, we are putting in a large screen in kind of a public place in the school where students can see it as they go past, get an idea of what's happening that day, whether it's a, an energy intensive day or not. And then we're also providing iPads and tablets to the schools where the students can really sit down and interact with the um, platform and it's particularly useful to groups that are maybe studying certain things at the time um, like the economic subjects will involve uh, elements about sustainability perhaps the transition years will spend a lot of time working on the platform and it's an opportunity for them to be engaged with the project and to even get engaged with the other demonstration schools that are involved in the project as well 
So this is one of our main deliverables from the project. Um, it's almost like a, an energy management system would be to a building supervisor, except it's far, far simplified. Um, and it's designed for the students themselves to be able to see data and take action themselves to um, reduce energy usage and be more sustainable. All of this ties up into what we call the school intervention strategy. So this is predominantly like a, a wall planner that each school has of activities for the coming year where they can uh, save energy, different little tasks they might do and like checking that lights and equipment is turned off on a Friday evening and at the end of the day, hosting an energy awareness day, um, using the educational modules in different classes and you know, inter interacting with the NRS platform regularly to see how their school is performing. And the idea of this intervention strategy is that when we talk to the different schools, and it's something that I'm sure if you ever talk to any company that has tried to do these kind of sustainable interventions, will probably say the same. Um, for example, if you put up a series of posters that talk about sustainability, everyone will see them for the first maybe week or two of, of when they go up. And then after that, they become background noise and uh, people won't really see them anymore and they may forget to take action. You know, for the first few weeks, they'll get very good at you know, remembering to print less or to turn off the lights or turn off the computer at lunchtime. But then they forget over time. So the idea of the intervention strategy is that it's designed so that the interventions are refreshed in the school every week or month or every term so that nobody forgets about um, the different interventions that are in play in the school. So as part of this, the students and teachers get together and hold a workshop where they look at a catalogue of interventions that we've developed in the project that are small tasks to big tasks. It may be um, adjusting the heating settings in their school. It may be creating posters in art class to remind students to switch off equipment. Um, it can really take a, a variety of forms. Um, and when they go through the intervention catalogue, they pick out the interventions that they would like to run in their school. They take a look at what's required and who needs to be involved. And then once they're happy that they're going to do the intervention, we have a wall planner for them where they assign it to maybe, you know, every Friday of a week or maybe once a month. And once it's on the calendar, they're all reminded of what's coming up in the school. Um, and it links back to the NERS platform as well. We can display the same planner on the platform for them so that they're, they can really be reminded of what's coming up in the school. So the idea of the intervention strategy is that it brings together a lot of the different tools that we've developed um, and it will help the school manage their own sustainability initiatives once the project ends and even in other schools across Northwest Europe when the project is over. That's kind of a bit of a crash course in everything that's involved in the NERS project. Um, the overall idea is that it's an overarching and adaptable methodology that can be adapted to any school in Northwest Europe um, or any second level school in Northwest Europe. And it has a lot of different tools that, you know, some schools may want to use all of them, other schools may only want to use one or two. And that's perfectly fine. It's designed so that you can choose and pick what uh, activities you want to carry out. And it all adds up to helping the school be more sustainable and, and educating our future decision makers on what they can do to be more sustainable um, in their lives going forward. That is really all I want to talk about for today. Um, thank you all for your time and, and we'll take any questions at the end of the session. Thank you very much, Adele. Very interesting presentation. Um, energy efficiency in buildings is extremely important, particularly now when you know, we are all moving toward uh, a carbon neutral society. Uh, and so, as you mentioned, the low cost solutions for long term resource efficiency are really crucial. And it's a really interesting project kind of, you know, educating the young generation, those who will be the decision makers in the future. Uh, and children definitely have impact not only on themselves, but also on their parents and grandparents, etc. So, so it was great to see the importance of working together and involving the students uh, with the aim to, to kind of provide more sustainable buildings. Thanks very much. Thanks. So now um, I'll int introduce our last speaker, Dr. Uh, Marcel Lumens from Eindhoven University of Technology. Marcel, do you want to uh, put on your camera and turn on yeah. the presentation? I will. I will. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. Good afternoon. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, sorry. <laughs> um, well, my name is, is Marcel Lomas. Indeed, I'm uh, working at the uh, Eindhoven University of Technology in, in the Netherlands, uh, Department of the Built Environment. And I have a focus area which is on uh, building performance, indoor environmental quality and health. So it's a nice connection with the, the previous uh, uh, presentation on focuses on energy. But in the end, we are, um, yeah, of course, interested in what, what, is, what is happening in the building is the uh, environment that we are creating for our uh, pupils for our uh, students is that uh, good enough to uh, yeah to, so that they can perform optimally and that's what we are looking into so in my presentation i will use some work which is being performed or research is being performed at the moment by Hank Brink, which is a phd student and i'm very uh, grateful for him that i could uh, lend some of his uh, work for this one and that is also supervised by professor Helian de Kort and uh, professor mark Maubach to also uh, acknowledge their uh, contribution in this one. So the, the main part will be about that, that work, uh, but also have some uh, yeah, additional examples of some research that we did or uh, comments that I would like to make when it refers to classrooms and why they are so special. So first, uh, let's make the step of what is the indoor environment? So uh, the, uh, the, the previous uh, presentation it was more about sustainability, energy, also some mentioning already was made about CO2 levels and temperature. Well, the indoor environment is a, uh, a number of things and I usually uh, confine them to four uh, main parameters, which is the air quality, thermal comfort, acoustical comfort, and visual comfort. And then the question is, okay, what is important of these four? Uh, do, do we need to deal with them uh, all? Well, this graph shows a result from uh, a article from Kim and the Deer in which they compared uh, 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 investigations into buildings and, and also educational buildings in this case into uh, what is what is now regarded most important in those in those cases and you see quite a diverse outcome meaning that uh, uh, at sometimes the air quality is regarded more important and, and sometimes the thermal part but also the acoustic conditions can be uh, uh, the main issue of concern so you see there's no one uh, 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 part in the indoor environment, which, which needs all, all the focus. The next one is also in interesting to look into. That's the, oh, yeah, so, yes. the, 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 the uh, idea about, can we uh, make the indoor environment such that we uh, uh, satisfy the occupant as much as possible? And of course we have these four parameters that we can use uh, for that. And then I would like to bring up this, this Kano model, which again is also from the same article, which shows on the vertical line the, the occupant satisfaction. And, uh, and then it also mentions some uh, factors. And we have this, this occupant satisfaction, in this case, if we look to the indoor environment, of course, deals with the comfort and with the health of the people uh, that should be op optimal. And with these factors, we can control this, this satisfaction a bit. And of course, we have. Uh, Three types of factors in this case uh, it's bonus factors which are if you can satisfy if you can bring them in will give you extra satisfaction eh, when they are available we have proportional factors meaning that we if we improve the performance of these factors that we also will increase the satisfaction and then we have basic factors and basic factors more or less says well you need these ha have these factors uh, okay so that they perform uh, uh, well Otherwise, if, if it's not the case, then you will, uh, yeah, it will result in dissatisfaction. So the, what uh, Kim and the Dia did was they tried to connect this, this model to the indoor environment and what parameters or what factors could be bonus factors or proportional factors or basic factors. Well, from their review, they didn't find, unfortunately, any bonus factors. So with respect to the indoor environment, we're looking at proportional factors and basic factors only. And the basic factors that, that they found were the temperature and the sound pressure level. So meaning these should be at a minimum level to avoid uh, 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 dissatisfaction. And minimum, I mean that, 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 that they should be as high as possible because otherwise you, you will create dissatisfaction. And then there were some proportional factors they found referring to air quality, illumination, visual comfort, and speech intelligibility. So it's, we see that with the indoor environment, we can control the satisfaction of course we are aware of that we know that but still it's nice to have this this model uh, in place to to position them a bit better but in the end what are we doing this for why are we building our uh, educational buildings we want to do this for the for the 
pupils for the uh, the students to allow them to have as a good uh, environment as possible and that is of course for the whole built environment but if you then look to a, a healthy indoor environment and related to classrooms or the, uh, the educational uh, buildings then we want to create an environment where they can perform optimally and for classrooms that mean as high as possible learning performance so uh, that, that you're not distracted or whatever that you can really focus on what you are therefore at, at that time in the classroom so how uh, can we do that and what, what can we uh, um, do to assure that this indeed is possible well in the netherlands we have a so-called program of requirements frisse scholen i translated directly in fresh schools and in that we have a, a number of requirements related to the indoor environment uh, it's for example on the air quality uh, particular matter but also on thermal comfort on lighting condition and acoustical conditions so it's all included and and these requirements are uh, different if you look to uh, the levels so we have three levels in in this uh, program of requirements from c meaning more or less the the, the building degree requirements up to a where it's really a uh, 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 very high quality uh, uh, indoor environment that we aim for. So meaning we have uh, high uh, uh, requirements on the thermal part, uh, on the thermal comfort part, on the on the air quality part and so on. So that's that's our uh, point of departure. But the st question still remains uh, how to deal with this in, in reality because the classroom is, is of course challenging. And, and it's challenging because we put a lot of people in quite a, a, a small room and these people are heat sources, they uh, uh, produce contaminations, bioaffluents, for example, but nowadays also, of course, we are concerned with, with, uh, with viruses. And uh, we have a limited floor area and space, meaning that we have a high occupant density. So that's, that makes it difficult to design good classrooms. But on the other hand, we, we still want to have thermal comfort and air quality. So that's, and, and also good lighting conditions and a good acoustical conditions. So that, that makes, I think it, it's really a, an interesting place for designing a good in, indoor environment. But the question still remains, so what should these conditions be if you want to assure an optimal learning performance? And that's work that's being done by, by Hank Brink, which is this uh, PhD research I, I uh, started off with. So he is working on answering this question or trying to answer this question, what is the effect of, of indoor environment on learning performance and do all these parameters uh, affect the performance individually or in combination? So how does he do that? Well, he started off with a literature study and he is now performing experiments. And in the, uh, in the next slides, I will tell you a little bit about the outcomes of the literature study, which is published in the meantime, and experiments which are, which are ongoing. So first a part of experiments already, has been finished, the, uh, the, the second part is, is ongoing at the moment. So going to the literature study, here you see the, the outcome of that literature study in this it's graph. And uh, what it shows is uh, over the years on the, uh, on the horizontal axis and vertically, it's, it's the number of studies that were found. And what you see that over the years, there's an increased attention for uh, the indoor environment and classroom. In this case, the focus was on, on higher education. Uh, what is also notable is that if you look to studies which cover all these four indoor environmental parameters, that they are quite rare, eh? only a few pop up. And so the black, uh, 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 the black uh, indicated um, uh, outcomes on, on, in the graph, there's eh? so only three studies really seem to combine all these four parameters. A lot are on individual parameters or combinations of parameters, but, but the whole is really rare at the moment. But what we all, uh, what, what we can see is from these studies that in general, a good indoor environment contributes positively to the uh, uh, quality of learning and the short learning outcomes and the short learning, uh, short term learning uh, performance. If you look to long term uh, performance, that really is an, uh, something which is not uh, yet well researched and also much more difficult, of course, but it's, of course, also something which should interest us. Uh, well, this, this situation, as you showed here, I think it's probably also what, what happened in, in Ireland, at least in Lens, uh, it, it was called on to ventilate as much as possible, also in winter time last year, and, uh, and also yeah, this year even, 
if, if the, the systems have, haven't been upgraded, it's still uh, good to, to ventilate a lot, but it means that in this case, thermal comfort was uh, compromised. So I hope, uh, yeah, we, we can change our, uh, the, the situation uh, in, in due course with, with the upgrade of, of the school buildings. But, uh, but of course, in this case, again, the connection between thermal comfort, air quality, you see the, the difficulty in, 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 in uh, issues that are at stake. Well, going to the experiments, uh, the question was, is uh, how do the indoor environmental conditions affect the performance of students? And, and again, we focus here on higher education, but I think you can also uh, bring it to uh, the, the other types of education that are, uh, uh, that are there. And, and what uh, Hank did in this case was he uh, defined, designed a framework also based on literature that more or less links the, the indoor environment uh, to the uh, academic performance on the right side. Uh, and this framework he used to develop his experiment. Of course, it's important to mention that there are many other aspects at play uh, which are not really uh, related to the in indoor environment, but it's just that, that we are aware of that, but our focus is on the, on the indoor environment. So from this framework, he, he built this uh, uh, yeah, reduced framework, I could call it, and uh, he indicated there which variables all needed to be uh, analyzed, measured, surveyed, or whatever. So he developed a measurement protocol, surveys, and also tests, and that's the, the, on the right part. Tests are uh, also uh, tests which are uh, trying to... Uh, to, to um, uh, find out how quickly students can respond uh, to something, but also tests which really deal with the uh, actual lecture being performed at the moment. Because the idea was that these experiments were run in, in normal classrooms where uh, students have normal lectures. And in combination with the teacher, at the end of each lecture, there was also a kind of small uh, um, uh, assignment where they needed to answer a few questions to, uh, to see how well they uh, uh, understood what was taught, how well they uh, received the information. So the protocol that was designed, that in this case, uh, there was a two hour lecture, as, as indicated, this is a lecture, just a, a normal lecture. Then there was a 10 minute break. And then the, the next step was to fill in uh, uh, an online questionnaire and to do the uh, academic performance test. And in the meantime, also measurements were taken of the indoor environment, of course. Uh, this first results that I show now are from February 2020, just before the <coughs> uh, outbreak of the uh, Corona pand pandemic. And we had uh, a, quite a good uh, number of participants. And from the outcomes, then we could also uh, take some conclusions. So in these experiments, not the full protocol was applied, only those parts that were developed by Hank, because many parts of the protocol also were taken from literature. So they were already established. The experiments were done in, in two classrooms. Uh, they were uh, identical classrooms uh, located in Groningen, which is in, is in the northern part of the Netherlands. And, uh, and you see here some pictures and, and drawing of that. So they, they were just normal standard uh, uh, classrooms with, uh, in this case, of course, some equipment installed to, to measure the indoor environment and, and, uh, and stuff. So here's some outcomes of those uh, 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 measurements of the indoor environment. I will not go too deep into them. Uh, and also here's some examples of the survey that was, uh, that was done. So on perception, on the air quality, and also on the learning performance. So they, they were asked how they uh, uh, felt the, the air quality, for example, and how they uh, assumed that their learning performance was. Then uh, here's some of those outcomes again, also uh, shown in box plots. Uh, on, the, on the right side, uh, for example, the, uh, the uh, uh, academic uh, performance test, and it shows then the number of questions that were answered correctly, for example. Well, this data then was used to analyze further and to find, to see whether we could find some relations between all this information that was available. Uh, again, I take this framework, which I showed you earlier, and then I take it to the outcome of those, uh, of those uh, experiments. And we found uh, for the indoor air quality uh, uh, relations between what we measured on the air quality, the perceived air quality, 
and from the perceived equality also a relation between how the students perceive their cognitive performance and then the interesting outcome in this case was also that from this perceived cognitive performance it could also be that there was also a relation with the uh, academic performance so the, the actual uh, performance the short-term academic performance so it's a nice to see this outcome because in this case we didn't control any of the conditions in in the room so we just let it uh, uh, flow and from these uh, uh, from from this situation we still could find some some uh, uh, links between indoor environment and in the end uh, the academic uh, performance so in the uh, discussion of the experiments it could be mentioned that we have really uh, relatively high co2 concentrations uh, so maybe the effects that we found were smaller than could have been if we if we started a bit uh, uh, lower so that we have higher larger differences uh, what we see is that the uh, uh, in the air quality uh, if, if it's not sufficient that it has a negative influence on the cognitive performance and uh, also from literature uh, uh, confirm more or less that if you have really high concentration that it can influence your cognitive performance quite uh, extensively so nice outcomes and of course uh, we uh, proceed with it uh, yeah. so it confirmed more or less what, what we knew but it's nice to see this link directly also with the uh, uh, performance test that we did so the con experiments are now uh, uh, continued and what we want to do is we want to see uh, how the individual uh, environmental parameters affect the uh, the academic performance and we do that by conditioning the both classes which were in the previous experiments run in a similar manner they are now run differently uh, and then we look into uh, different lighting conditions different uh, acoustic conditions different uh, thermal and air quality conditions and also we try to look at the combination of them so we combine uh, temperature air quality and in the end we combine also all four parameters and we do use the uh, requirements that are uh, put in this uh, program of requirements Frisse Scholar, which I talked about, and we then compare class A and B to, uh, to see whether it makes a difference also in the learning outcomes. So it's interesting to see how, how this develops. Experiments are, I think, now two thirds, three fourths uh, of, of what we aim to do. So hopefully next year we can finish it and, and also uh, uh, publish some outcomes of that. Well, that was the, the part of the work of, uh, of, of Hank and, and, and on the uh, indoor environment. I have some extra topics I also included in this presentation because it, yeah, it relates to classrooms and it might be of interest to you too. And of course, it also looks into the, the current situation of ventilation, corona, and how to deal with it in classrooms. And um, for that, I, I take this picture. Uh, and maybe you've seen it uh, in other uh, occasions, but it's. Um, it's a nice picture that shows you the difference between aerosols and large droplets and there has been quite a discussion on whether uh, uh, COVID is, is or corona is, is airborne or not well it is and, and the aerosols are uh, uh, the cause for that and the aerosols are produced by us when we are talking breathing uh, uh, singing or whatever we do so we produce air, uh, enormous amounts of, of aerosols and also these aerosols can contain these these viruses we also produce large droplets, but they are, well, uh, not, not that uh, much. And also uh, they, they fall out quite, quite quickly. But see, aerosols, they can linger in the air uh, for, for longer and, and not only close to the uh, person where the concentration, of course, is higher. So for that, I still uh, would advise you to keep distance. But if you look to further uh, in the room, so further away from, from a person, then we have uh, uh, still the air, these aerosols present. And uh, how we can deal with that is we can dilute them and we dilute them, of course, by applying ventilation. So that's the, the steps that we can take. And then the question is, of course, well, how much should we ventilate and what does that mean for our uh, risks of infection? Well, uh, a very relatively simple model uh, that's very often used is the Wells-Riley model. And this Wells-Riley model is, uh, is shown in this, uh, this equation. I will not go into the details of the equation, but it, it's possible with this equation to say a bit about the infection risk that you can have uh, when you are in a certain room where uh, 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 um, a person is uh, present 
which which is infected and is producing uh, yeah uh, virus uh, uh, in, in 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 the air and and what it shows here is this graph is on the uh, the horizontal axis uh, uh, the flow rate and the exposure time and on the vertical axis the infection risk and this is the outcome for a uh, for a classroom with some assumptions on how much uh, uh, viruses virus particles are being produced and that's mentioned in terms of quantum which is a special form of uh, yeah the, the amount of viruses that are being produced so it's not not directly that there are 10 viruses produced but it's it's a bit different but i think it's too much to to explain that here today but it shows you that if you uh, uh, uh use the, this uh well right well Riley um equation you can tell something about the infection risk and i increase it here a bit uh, further with another uh, example where we are uh, talking and then we produce more of these quanta and then you see also that if you uh, ventilate more that you uh, decrease the risk while if you stay longer in the room you increase the risk uh, or, uh, sorry if you ventilate more you decrease the risk and if you stay longer in the room you increase the risk and it means also that well good ventilation is a a good, very good starting point, and maybe at, at some point uh, the amount of ventilation is so high that you also want to combine it with with air cleaning, so to to assure that you can take out these these aerosols from the air. And if you are in in a, in a room for a long time, you will need a lot of uh, ventilation or air cleaning to assure that the risk stays low. <coughs> it's um, some uh, remarks should be weighed if you look to this Wells Riley equation. And that's uh, the, the fact that we assume perfect mixing. And this amount of quanta is really an issue where, um, yeah, that there's quite a large range of, of quanta that's being uh, produced. And, and there's also not uh, uh, always uh, yeah, good agreement between the amount of quanta that are produced by a specific person. So in this case, it's not that easy to look into the infection risk at absolute levels, but it's a nice way to compare different solutions and see how much improvement is possible. Um, then looking at CO2 levels, uh, it was just also mentioned that, that if you measure CO2, you have an idea about the ventilation in, in the room, which is uh, uh, certainly correct. Uh, but the question is, how does that compare to, to viruses? And in this case, in, in the Netherlands, uh, the uh, uh, advice is given, if, 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 if you have not enough ventilation, uh, your CO2 levels are too high, please remove some of the people from the room to assure that you have sufficient ventilation. Well, if you look to CO2 levels, that's a correct assumption. Uh, if you take out some of the sources, because we are all sources, you will lower the uh, concentration in the room with the same amount of ventilation. But if you look at a virus, then it's a different situation. So if you take out a few people, but still leave the infected person in the room, then nothing changes if you look to infection risk. So that's uh, uh, good to be aware of if you are looking at ventilation and, and the number of people in the room. Another issue is if you look into uh, uh, ventilation, for example, uh, for a primary school where the occupation is, is, uh, is 50 percent due to circumstances, and you measure a CO2 concentration of 1200 ppm. 1200 ppm in, in the Netherlands is uh, the level we assume for the building decree, so uh, it shouldn't get much higher than that, uh, but, but 1200 sh should be okay. Personally, I would like to have it lower. Uh, but the example in this case is 1200 ppm. And we have the other one is a full occupied uh, classroom, secondary school, and also has 1200 ppm. And then the question is, is the ventilation sufficient in both cases? And we are not uh, controlling the ventilation on the CO2 level in this case. But the, the answer is that it's not, not true. Eh? So in this case, the ventilation in the primary school is really uh, not insufficient because we know that Children uh, 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 at, at lower age also produce less CO2. And uh, we know with the occupation uh, only half that there is uh, insufficient ventilation if all uh, pupils would be in it. So there is some need for attention. While the other example, it seems to be uh, fairly okay if you uh, would assume that 1200 ppm is acceptable. Another thing to think about is how we ventilate our classrooms. Yeah, and normally, like uh, we, we assume it's, it's fully mixed, optimally mixed, which which is, I think, or generally, will be quite close to that. 
but we can think of ventilation in a different way and also see how we can ventilate more efficient. And the example now on the page is, is not efficient ventilation because here we have a kind of short circuiting, meaning that part of the room is not well ventilated. And though, so this can just happen in any classroom or any room if your design is not, not correct. We are better off if we assume a situation where we can really uh, take out the source quite quickly from the room. So assure that the major part of the room is, is, is clean while the contamination is removed quite efficiently. So that's, that's how we could look into this. And we did some studies on a, uh, a system which was designed uh, by a, a company uh, in which they wanted to apply a kind of displacement type of ventilation. And that's a ventilation system where you bring in air at floor level, usually a bit cooler. And that cold air will, will uh, spread around the floor. And because of the, the heat from the occupants, it will rise and then it will be taken off. So that's a, a quite efficient type of, uh, of ventilation that is, uh, that is created in this way. And it would be interesting also for classrooms to take out the, uh, the heat and the, uh, the contaminants that are produced. So what we did, we did some measurements uh, in, in a classroom and uh, a, a mock-up of that. And we uh, looked into the air change efficiency, which is a, a parameter, an indicator to say something about how efficiently the ventilation is uh, in that room. And if you have higher levels of the air change efficiency, you have a more efficient uh, type of ventilation. So in this case, we also look into what happens if you uh, uh, apply more, uh, uh, a higher ventilation rate through your uh, supply grills, uh, and what happens with the air change efficiency. And what you see, is that the, uh, the efficiency drops quite uh, dramatically in the sense that uh, you're, you think you are ventilating better, but in the end, your, uh, uh, the outcome is not, not in line with that. So the improvement is, is not uh, as you would have expected. So more air is not always more efficient in this case, if we look to this uh, uh, displacement type of solution. And again, this, sees, or this, this shows that it's not that easy to uh, design good indoor environments for, for classrooms. And then the last one, uh, a bit different study that we did uh, was on thermal comfort. Uh, and then the question also was, well, if, if students come into uh, to a lecture in the morning, how long does it take for, for them to adapt to the thermal conditions in, in the room, uh, in, in, the, in the lecture uh, hall? And we did a, a study in which we uh, asked students uh, at the start of a, a normal lecture, uh, to participate in a, in a questionnaire. And we had some questionnaires run at 10, 20, and 45 minutes at the end of the, the lecture, uh, asking questions on, on the thermal comfort, uh, the preference, the, the clothing, and so on. And what we uh, uh, could conclude from the outcome is that there is an adaption taking place. So the first 20, 30 minutes of the uh, uh, students being in the, in the lecture room they relate their thermal environment more to the uh, outdoor conditions that where they were coming from than to the indoor environment. So this is a, uh, a good to be aware of. For example, if you are uh, conditioning your classrooms that you may delay your conditioning a bit so that the adaption also takes, is in line with, with, with the uh, uh, heating up of, or cooling down of, of the classroom. So again, uh, something where it shows that we have uh, several things to deal with if we are talking about classrooms. So I think there's still a lot to be discovered and it's uh, very interesting to do that. Uh, what I think is very important to, to look at what we are doing this for, and I think that's the learning performance of the students. It's not that we want to get to some temperature or to some CO2 level or uh, any other uh, performance indicator that we are aiming for. I think the main one is the learning performance and I hope we can look into that uh, more and more in this, uh, in this case. And I think it's good to invest in a good indoor environment. Uh, it's very attractive. Uh, that's not only for the, for the student because he, he will or she will learn better and more, but I think it's also good for, uh, yeah, for your country uh, to, to, uh, to stimulate that and to, to make these investments because in the end, yeah, the outcome will be positive, I'm sure. And that was my last slide. I thank you for your attention. And um, so I just want to thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank all the speakers for excellent presentations. I think it was just really informative and very, very good event. I will uh, 
I, I definitely took a lot of uh, points from, from your presentation. So thank you very much for, for committing your time uh, today. And just for everyone else, uh, I just want to mention that there will be more events uh, organized as part of the Engineering National Development CPD series. And we have three next events aligned already uh, on the 27th of January on sustainable mobility, on the 3rd of February on sustainable management of water and other environmental resources, uh, and on the 9th of February on circular economy in the built environment. So all you know, all topics very closely linked also to, to what we discussed today. And all the bookings can be made by the um, on the Engineers Ireland website. And there will be uh, more events coming, so keep an eye on the on the website.